Congratulations. You have decided to use swine artificial insemination on your farm. AI is a tool to help top swine producers efficiently achieve their production goals. AI benefits three main areas of swine production. It improves genetics, helps to maintain a healthy herd, and improves your bottom line. Let's take a look at the first area, genetics. With AI, the producer is able to access the top genetics from around the world. It doesn't matter if you have a hundred or a hundred thousand sows. The opportunity is there for every producer to use the very best genetics the industry has to offer. You as a producer have the opportunity to sample different genetics and see on your own farm which genetics will work best. Today's packing house standards require genetically lean, consistent animals to fit the health-conscious lifestyle of the consumer, whether dining out or at home. Pork has become recognized as the other white meat thanks to the National Pork Producers Council's advertising campaign. Economics is the second benefit. With AI, fewer boars are needed, resulting in decreased feed and housing costs. In an existing facility, the switch to AI gives you the chance to reduce boar space to put more sows in production. One common misconception is that AI will reduce the amount of labor overall. The type of labor being done will change, but the amount of labor may not. The idea of eliminating labor should not be a factor in your decision to implement an AI program. It is only one of many considerations when looking at AI. Health is another important benefit. With AI, there are fewer new additions to a herd. In fact, most new genetics can be introduced through artificial insemination. Some diseases can be transferred through semen, but far less than bringing live animals to the farm. When purchasing semen from a reputable semen center which follows strict protocols, AI is a very safe way to bring in new genetic material. In order to maximize the benefits from artificial insemination, you must develop a system to best facilitate the transfer of genetic material from the male to the female. Let's take a closer look at the company that can help you develop that system. IMV serves the world from our corporate headquarters in the heart of Normandy, France. Here, production of AI products for over 14 species moves along at a rapid pace. Today, IMV is involved in fresh and frozen semen, artificial insemination, embryo transfer, and gamete freezing in many species. IMV is also one of the few companies around the world helping to preserve endangered species from extinction, such as the black... The boar's genital system functions as a conduit for the transport of sperm cells produced in the testes to the site of collection or deposition via the penis. Along with the testes and penis, this system involves a series of ducts and accessory sex glands in addition to their respective nerve and blood supplies. The testicles are also responsible for the production of functional spermatozoa and reproductive hormones such as testosterone. The testicular growth occurs mostly during the boar's adolescent period from 6 to 18 months of age. The testicles are contained in the non-pendulous scrotum, located immediately below the rectum of the boar. The unique positioning of the scrotum and the testicles allows for the temperature of the blood flowing from the testicular surface into the testicle to be several degrees lower than that of the boar's core body temperature. This lower temperature is essential for normal sperm production. If testicular temperature increases, as would occur during a fever or heat stress, normal sperm production can be disrupted. The sperm cell's primary function is to serve as a transmitter of the boar's genetic information. The spermatozoan is formed in the testicle from a round-shaped cell known as the spermatogonium. Through a complex process involving multiple cell divisions and differentiation, immature spermatozoa are formed. As these immature sperm are produced, they pass from the testicle into a structure known as the epididymis. In the initial and middle parts of the epididymis, the immature sperm undergo a maturation process in which they gain the ability to fertilize the egg. 
After undergoing this process, the mature sperm are concentrated and then stored in the most terminal part of the epididymis. It takes approximately 60 days for the sperm's development process. Therefore, sperm which appear in a freshly collected ejaculate today actually started to develop in the testicle almost two months previously. During ejaculation, muscle contractions cause the sperm to be propelled from the terminal part of the epididymis. Stimulation of these muscle contractions occurs in part due to pressure applied to sensory nerves located in the tip of the penis. Along with propulsion of the spermatozoa, these muscle contractions also cause the release of the fluid contents of the accessory sex glands. These fluid and gel fractions contribute the vast majority of the volume to an ejaculate. The accessory sex glands are very large. Therefore, it may take several minutes for their secretions to be contributed to the ejaculate. Various muscle contractions occurring in different accessory glands at different times add the reproductive fluids during the ejaculation process. This is what gives the boar's semen the fractionated appearance. This normal event can be observed during semen collection, where some parts of the ejaculate appear sperm dense, and other parts are relatively devoid of sperm cells. Mixture of the sperm-dense portion, which is contributed from the epididymis, with the accessory sex gland fluids, yields the final product, which we call semen. Normal semen is creamy in appearance and should have only a slightly salty smell. If the semen has a boar taint or scent, the semen should be discarded. It should also not have a pink or red appearance. This would indicate blood in the semen. Now that we have a working knowledge of how sperm is produced, we can look at the actual collection of the sperm and what to expect. The bore should be collected in a pen approximately 8 feet by 8 feet. The collection area should be free of distractions and have escape routes for the collector. A sturdy adjustable dummy sow should be comfortable for the bore. The area where the penis is extended should be open and allow for easy access for the collector. A rubber mat is used to help provide better footing for the animal. When training boars to be collected, keep in mind their sexual development. As the young boar reaches sexual maturity, he develops a natural mounting instinct. This instinct is fairly non-specific, and the boar will mount nearly anything, including gilts, other boars, or the dummy sow. This is the best time to train the boar. A young immature boar or an older boar experienced at natural mating may be difficult to train. In preparation for the collection, you should prepare the collection thermos with filter. Place two vinyl powder-free gloves on the collection hand. Allow the boar to mount the dummy sow. Empty out any urine or propitial fluid from the sheath and dry off the area with a paper towel. Remove the outer glove. Begin collecting. The bore should begin thrusting as the collector attempts to grip the penis. Make a cone shape with the hand and allow the bore's penis to enter the hand. Then, gripping the penis to achieve a lock, the boar will extend his penis out fully and ejaculation will begin. Keep in mind that each animal is different with its own personality and preferences, but try to keep the procedure as simple and standardized as possible. Always let the boar completely finish before releasing the penis to make sure the experience is satisfying to the animal. After collection is complete, you will notice the boar starting to look around the area. At this time, he will retract the penis, and you should help ease the boar off of the dummy sow to prevent any injuries during the dismounting. Remember that patience is a key to animal husbandry, and if you lose your patience with a young boar, you may never regain his trust. If you or the boar are becoming frustrated, return the boar to his pen, ending the session, and try again another day. 
Once collected, the semen should be quickly transported to the AI lab for analysis and processing. Biosecurity in the AI lab is very critical. Efficient and hygienic semen collection is the key to successful boar stud management. This in-focus video will address aspects of semen collection in detail. The video will be divided into three main sections. Semen collection facilities, semen collection technique, and boar training. Semen collection is potentially dangerous. Health and safety aspects of this procedure are very important. The facility should be designed to allow good semen collection practices which are hygienic and safe. For these reasons, semen should be collected in a room or pen specially designed for this purpose. The number of pens will depend upon the size of the stud, staffing levels, and the daily workload. In practice, one collection pen for each collector individually working simultaneously is sufficient. The pen should be positioned in the stud to provide for ease of movement of bores to and from after the collection. The semen should be protected from cold shock throughout the journey by packing into an insulated box or vessel. Placing a container of warm water in the transport box can help maintain temperature. Many studs avoid temperature problems by positioning the collection pens adjacent to the lab with a warm pass-through heated to 37 degrees Celsius, providing a direct connection between the two stations. In very large studs, where this is impractical, semen can be transported via a pneumatic tube from the collection pen to the laboratory. Regardless of the semen transport system used, make sure there is good communication between the collection area and the lab. This is important from efficiency, health, and safety standpoints. Larger studs may choose to use an intercom or telephone link. Each collection pen should be approximately 6 by 8 feet. Larger pens will distract the bore. There should be no distractions in the pen, for example, a pressure hose or any loose fittings. The pen should have a non-slip floor surface to ensure that the bore can mount the dummy sow comfortably. Most studs make good use of a rubber mat placed behind the dummy sow. The safety features of the collection pen are very important. There should be no sharp projections which may result in injury to the collector or the bore. A rapid escape route must be provided for personnel involved in collecting. Strong safety poles should be fitted along at least one side of the pen. The distance between the poles should be 9.5 to 10.5 inches. However, this distance may need to be adjusted depending upon the size and age of the bores. This pen is entirely surrounded by safety poles. Some studs use a bore preparation pen adjacent to the collection pen. The bore is introduced into the preparation pen for a few minutes before collection, usually while another bore is being worked. This treatment exposes the bore to the sights, sounds, and smells of a collection and can speed up reaction time and improve collection efficiency. There should also be a utility area adjacent to the collection pen, a place where the collector can wash his or her hands, put on gloves, and so on. The day's semen collection equipment may also be stored in a warm cabinet along with tissues and gloves. A trash bin should be provided for used disposable items. The dummy sow should be strong and rigid and easy to clean. The most ideal models are also height adjustable, allowing bores of different sizes to mount and work in comfort and safety. The dummy should be fixed to the floor or be sufficiently heavy to be immovable by the bore. Lightweight and poorly constructed dummy cells are very dangerous for the bore and for the collector. This dummy cell meets all the requirements. It is strong, fixed to the floor, and height adjustable. It is fitted with shoulders that enable the bore to settle comfortably while mounted. It is constructed of steel and can easily be washed and disinfected. Semen must be collected into a clean, dry receptacle. An insulated collection cup and a disposable collection bag are ideal. This non-spermicidal plastic bag is designed specifically for the collection and processing of boar semen. The ejaculate is collected into the bag that has been fitted into an insulated collection cup. Following collection, the ejaculate is transported directly to the lab and held in the bag for further processing. 
With its working capacity of two liters, the bag is large enough to hold the entire extended ejaculate. By extending the ejaculate in the collection bag, the semen is not subjected to a series of transfers into different receptacles, and the risk of sperm damage and contamination is reduced. During collection, the ejaculate must be filtered to remove the gel component. For efficiency of labor, hygiene, and semen quality, the mini-tube plastic perforated universal semen bag should be used. Here, the universal semen bag is being fitted into the insulated collection vessel. Notice the filter is incorporated into the universal semen bag, and these bags are available pre-sterilized. As the top of the collection bag is pulled down over the outside of the collection vessel, the filter opens in a funnel shape. A rubber band is not required. Non-woven filters and woven gauze can be used with the original mini-tube plastic collection bag. These are held in place on the collection vessel with rubber bands and can be used singly or in multiple layers. The collection equipment must be assembled and ready for use before the bore is introduced into the collection pen. Before use, the collection equipment should be warmed to the required temperature, usually 37 degrees Celsius. Before beginning the collection, the container should be labeled with the bore's identification number. Barcode technology is used for this in the larger studs. The collector should wash his or her hands before each collection and put on vinyl gloves. The type of glove is a very important consideration as some gloves are actually toxic to sperm. The best gloves are made of vinyl. Problems with toxicity have been noticed, particularly with latex gloves. Gloves for semen collection should be tested by the supplier to ensure that they have no spermicidal properties. Ideally, two gloves are worn on the collecting hand at this time. This enables the collector to clean out the sheath and wipe away all traces of prepucial fluid before the bore starts to ejaculate. Then, the outer glove can be removed once the bore has settled onto the dummy sow and has started to ejaculate. A clean glove is used for the actual collection. <laughs> collection schedules will differ among studs depending upon semen demand throughout the week and the number of breeds or lines held at the stud. A good general rule for the workload is that a bore should not be worked more than three times in a two-week period. In other words, each bore should be used a maximum of one and a half times per week. Young boars, up to 12 months of age, should be gradually introduced to this work routine, starting with one collection per week. Older boars may be worked up to four times in two weeks if their capacity for semen production allows for this. Do not be tempted to overwork boars, however, as the effort will not be rewarded by a significant increase in output or quality. Semen collection requires patience and an empathy with the boar. The boar must always feel secure in the collection pen. Every effort should be made to ensure that no potentially distressing or traumatic procedures are performed in this area. For example, blood sampling, vaccination, or tusk trimming. Ideally, the person who performs such unpleasant procedures should not be one of the regular semen collectors. The boar is introduced into the collection room and allowed to investigate the dummy sow. After a few minutes, a train boar will start to mount the dummy sow. Once settled onto the dummy, the boar will start thrusting movements as if trying to serve a sow. This is now the opportunity to massage any fluid out of the sheath and to wipe away any prepucial fluid that is contaminating the area. At this time, the collector should remove the outer glove. During this period of thrusting, the boar's penis protrudes from the sheath, spiraling rapidly as if searching for the sow's vulva. At this stage, the collector should be ready to start collecting the ejaculate. Wearing a vinyl glove, the collector grasps the rotating spiral end of the penis. This procedure is not always easy. The collector's fingers mimic the shape of the sow's cervix as they close around the free spiral end of the penis. By moving the hand forward and backward with the thrusting movements of the boar, resistance can be minimized. Eventually, the boar will lock into the gloved hand. At this point, it is possible to fully extend the penis. The boar will then settle down and start to produce an ejaculate. A firm grip must be used throughout semen collection. Fluctuating the pressure and the grip can encourage the boar to continue the ejaculation. The ejaculate should be collected through a filter into the pre-warmed receptacle. The filter removes the gel component of the ejaculate.
the semen must be collected directly from the penis into the collecting vessel and not allowed to trickle over the glove first. The ejaculate is usually produced in a series of different fractions. At first, the ejaculate will look clear. This is mainly seminal plasma and does not need to be collected. The next fraction appears as a milky liquid. This is the sperm-rich fraction containing most of the sperm and should be collected. A third clear fraction follows and does not need to be collected. In some bores, it can be difficult to tell the difference between the different fractions. In these cases, the entire ejaculate may be collected. Toward the end of the ejaculation, the boar will become agitated and attempt to withdraw his penis into the sheath. There is often further ejaculation during this period, and a firm grip should be maintained to enable the boar to properly finish. This component of the ejaculate should not be collected, however. It is likely to contain only small numbers of sperm and a high level of contamination. Gel is produced throughout the ejaculation, but is particularly obvious toward the end. Throughout semen collection, contamination of the ejaculate with prepucial fluid must be avoided. This foul-smelling liquid comes from the prepuce and may trickle down the outside of the penis during collection. It is toxic to sperm. Just a small amount can kill the whole ejaculate. Some collectors wrap a tissue around the body of the penis to avoid contamination of the ejaculate with prepucial fluid. Holding the end of the penis above the level of the sheath throughout the collection will achieve the same result. Careful collection techniques are most important so that the semen is in good condition when it has been collected. After collection, the filter is removed from the collecting vessel. When using the mini-tube perforated plastic collection bag, its top is removed at the perforation to avoid contamination of the ejaculate. The ejaculate should be immediately transported to the lab after collection. When the bore has finished working, allow him to dismount. Return the bore to his own pen or crate. Ideally, training should start when the bore is in isolation. Many studs aim to train the majority of the bores, if not all of them, before they enter the main stud. This makes a significant difference in stud efficiency as expressed by the proportion of bore pens or crates actually filled with trained and working bores. Where bores are trained in isolation, they enter the stud having been proved acceptable for AI use. They will work on the dummy and the semen is of an acceptable quality. In practice, most studs that attempt to train all bores before entry to the main stud find that a small number of bores have not been trained within the required time frame. Under these circumstances, the additional stimulation of a new environment filled with working bores, along with the general activity and odors of semen collection, may well provide the necessary trigger to encourage them to start working. Whenever possible, aim to train at least 75% of each group of bores before allowing them to join the main stud. Training new bores requires a great deal of patience, persistence, and determination. It must be approached in a systematic and methodical way. While each bore needs to be treated as an individual, the basic steps in training are the same for every bore. Training can be a frustrating job for all those involved. If possible, make sure that all staff members share this responsibility, rotate training duty on a daily basis. This is important from the standpoints of efficiency and motivation. Do not leave this important job to only one member of the staff. Health and safety aspects of board training must not be overlooked. Always make sure there are two members of staff in the barn or isolation facility during training sessions. Before introducing a new bore to the collection pen, make sure that the dummy sow has been set to a low level. It can help if the collection room has already been used for collections that day and has not been washed down. The presence of bore odor, gel, and saliva can act as a stimulus. Make sure that there are no distractions in the collecting pen, for example, loose matting or a power washer. Be methodical about training bores. Once training has started, introduce each trainee to the collection pen every day for a 15 to 20 minute session. If the boar shows no interest in the dummy sow during this period of time, despite encouragement, return him to his pen or crate and try again the next day. Spending longer than 15 to 20 minutes with an individual boar on any occasion during training will serve only to frustrate both the boar and the trainer.
record progress on a daily basis, including any idiosyncrasies of behavior demonstrated by a new bore and all positive steps taken. A typical training session will begin with a period of up to five minutes during which the bore is allowed to investigate alone the new surroundings of the collection pen. The bore may show immediate interest in the dummy sow. If this is sustained, immediately enter the pen and start working with the bore. If after five minutes or so the bore has shown no interest in the dummy sow, enter the pen and begin working with him. Always conduct yourself in a calm, steady, and determined way during training sessions. Talk to the boar. Attempt to make physical contact with the boar. Make eye contact. These actions may take some time to achieve. Having introduced yourself to the boar, it is possible to progress to the next stage of the training process. Remember, all boars are different. They may have experienced different situations and will react differently. They will be frightened or excited by different objects or actions. Some will be curious. Others will be timid. Be prepared to treat each boar as an individual and develop an empathy with the boar as soon as possible. Some collectors reserve a special set of training coveralls that have been used for collections and never washed. Others hold on to the dummy, a sack filled with straw soaked in urine, saliva, and semen. Use of a pheromone spray on the dummy may be beneficial. Results with all these are variable, but they can help. Attempt to focus the boar's attention on the dummy sow. Maneuver the boar's head towards the dummy by encouragement and persuasion. Try patting the dummy and talking to the boar all the time. Make grunting noises. Nudge the boar's head towards the dummy with your knee. Kneel beside the dummy and attempt to make eye contact with the boar. Try blowing gently up the boar's nose. It is often easier to do all of this without an audience. The objective is to initiate and sustain the boar's interest in the dummy sow and to provide enough time for the boar to attempt to mount. Some boars do this almost immediately. Other boars can take several training sessions to achieve this. A word of caution should be expressed at this point. It is extremely dangerous and a totally unacceptable practice to position yourself between the boar and the dummy sow. For maximum safety, always keep your eyes on the boar and the use of tobacco products or the presence of food in the semen collection area will distract the boar and will have an adverse effect on training or the semen collection success. Tobacco and food products also infringe upon the important hygienic standards of semen collection. Once the boar is showing an interest in the dummy sow, it can help to start massaging the sheath and penis with a gloved hand to stimulate sexual activity. When the boar mounts the dummy sow, continue to massage the sheath. Eventually, the boar will start thrusting movements. Attempt to collect as previously shown. If a boar mounts the wrong end of the dummy sow, gently but firmly attempt to reorientate him. Avoid aggressive or sudden movements, however. The boar must not associate the collection pen with any unpleasant experiences. If the boar has settled onto the wrong end of the dummy during the first collection and reorientating him seems impossible, continue with the collection in the usual way. Make a note of this and attempt to correct this behavior the next time it occurs. It is, of course, undesirable for a boar to regularly mount the wrong end of the dummy. Once a boar has been successfully collected for the first time, the training should be reinforced by repeating the process on the next two consecutive days. The boar should be rested for five to seven days and then collected at least once a week. This is essential throughout the isolation period to make sure that the boar is willing and able to work once he joins the main stud. The first few ejaculates should be used for detailed semen evaluation only. The boar is then ready to join the main boar inventory after the isolation period. Efficient and hygienic semen collection is key to successful boar stud management. Establishment of well-designed and high-quality collection facilities, a careful, consistent, and organized approach to training, and standardization of excellent practice will achieve this. Seek advice and help. Call the experts at Minitube.
There are a number of requirements that are essential for any AI program to succeed, regardless of the size of the facility. To be successful, AI requires attention to every detail involved. In this video, we will focus on the components and procedures of semen processing and will emphasize the available methods and equipment to perform each step. Semen processing involves the following important steps. Extender preparation. Determination of ejaculate volume. Determination of sperm concentration. Evaluation of sperm quality. Calculation of AI doses. Semen extension. Semen packaging. Cooling and storing of AI doses. Extender preparation. Water quality is a critical component of extender preparation and therefore directly affects the quality of semen doses. At a minimum, steam distilled water should be used. The best quality water is produced by the processes of reverse osmosis and deionization. Water quality is measured by electrical conductivity or resistivity. Purified water can be purchased locally or produced on site in the bore stud. The economics of purchasing versus producing purified water are dependent on the quality of the local water to be purified and the amount of purified water required. Exact details can be provided by Minitube. Extenders are characterized by their ability to maintain semen quality and fertility during storage. BTS is the most widely used short-term extender and provides the ability to store most ejaculates from most bores for up to one to two days after collection. Merck 3 is a medium-term extender for storage of semen for up to five days after collection. Androhep and Androhep Plus are the global gold standard extenders for storage up to seven days after collection. The superiority of Androhep and Androhep Plus, even for short-term storage, is supported by field data. Androhep Lite is a member of the Androhep family of extenders. It provides the qualities and characteristics of Androhep Plus as an extender for storage of semen up to six days. Minitubes extenders are available in pouches with pre-weighed extender powder to prepare one liter or in bulk to prepare up to 100 liters. Extenders are manufactured under pharmaceutical white room conditions. All components are pre-qualified to be non-toxic to sperm cells. Following production, each batch is first biochemically evaluated and then biologically tested using bore semen. Customers receive a certificate of analysis with each purchase. To prepare extender, the correct volume of purified water is measured into a suitable container. The best way to do this is to measure the volume by weight and to dispense the water directly into a disposable plastic bag. Note that one milliliter of water weighs one gram. The use of disposable plastic bags eliminates the need for special cleaning and sanitizing of reusable plastic or glass containers. Remember, anything that comes in contact with the extender or semen must be properly cleaned and sterilized. Disposables eliminate this concern. It is best to pre-warm the purified water to 30 to 35 degrees Celsius 86 to 95 degrees Fahrenheit prior to preparation of extender. The powder will dissolve easier in warm water than in cold water. The extender powder is added to the correct volume of water. Gentle stirring or mixing can be done by hand using a glass stirring rod or by using a magnetic stirring unit. It is recommended that the prepared extender be maintained for approximately 60 minutes prior to use. This will allow determination of ejaculate volume. Semen volume is most easily measured by determining the weight in grams of the ejaculate. One gram of semen is equivalent to one milliliter of semen. The electronic balance is teared to zero grams. The collection cup is placed on the balance and the tear button is pressed. The display will now again show zero grams. Remove the bag with the ejaculate from the collection cup by lifting it straight up and hold it out of the cup just long enough to allow the reading of the balance to stabilize. Note the weight which is displayed as a negative number. This negative number represents the amount of weight removed, that of the collection bag and the semen. 
Therefore, the actual weight, volume, of the ejaculate is 10 grams less than the displayed number. For example, if the display reads 175 grams with the bag of semen removed from the cup, subtract 10 grams for an ejaculate volume of 165 milliliters. As an alternative procedure, after placing the collection cup, collection bag, and semen on a scale and tearing to zero, the collection bag with semen can be quickly transferred to one of the cylinders of a mini-tube water bath. The water bath should be maintained at approximately 37 degrees Celsius, 98 degrees Fahrenheit. Since within the plastic cylinders, temperatures will be maintained approximately 1 to 2 degrees Celsius lower. The inside of the cylinder is dry, but warm by the surrounding water. Therefore, the semen will be kept warm, but not temperature shocked by direct contact with the water. The collection should only remain in the water bath for a few minutes prior to adding extender. Determination of sperm concentration. The second processing step is the determination of sperm concentration in the raw semen. Four basic methods are used for this procedure. Visual estimation of concentration by color. Keras densimeter, hemocytometer, photometer, spermacue. The first method is a visual estimate of concentration based upon color of the ejaculate. This method provides only a crude idea at best of the concentration and only allows you to make a guess as to how far to extend the semen. If a large volume of white or cream-like semen was collected, 12 to 15 doses can probably be made since the sperm concentration is probably very high. If, however, the ejaculate is low in volume and appears cloudy or skim milk-like, then only approximately 4 to 6 doses should be prepared because the sperm concentration is low. Estimates of the number of doses that can be made should be done conservatively in order to be certain that enough spermatozoa are in each AI dose. Sperm concentration estimates can be made quickly and easily using the Keras densimeter. 9 milliliters of 2.9% sodium citrate should first be pipetted into the densimeter. After carefully mixing, 1 milliliter of raw semen is added. The densimeter is then covered with a small piece of parafilm and inverted 2 to 3 times in order to mix well. To estimate the concentration, the densimeter is placed in front of a solid white surface or paper. Holding the unit at arm's length at eye level, the scale is observed. First, the markings for the printed numbers, 60, 70, 80, and so forth, are identified. Look for the highest number that is clearly readable, such that the next highest number is cloudy. As shown here, the mark for 50 is clear, while that for 60 is cloudy and not readable. Next, look at the half-scale number markings. For example, 65, 75, and 85. The line for 55 is clearly readable, while for 60 it is not. The answer is then 55. Using the chart supplied with the densimeter, the estimated concentration is determined. In this example, the concentration is 265 million sperm per milliliter. The densimeter should be thoroughly rinsed with clean water in between uses. The third method for determining sperm concentration is using a special microscope slide called a hemocytometer. This tech of you with its special cover slip in place. The cover slips are made specifically for a hemocytometer and are perfectly flat. Load each side of the counting chamber by placing the end of the pipette in the groove of the chamber and gently squeezing the vial. The diluted semen should fill the chamber completely. It is important to completely fill but not overfill the chamber. Once both sides of the chamber are filled, gently place the chamber aside for at least five minutes to allow the sperm cells to settle onto the surface of the counting grid. Do not allow the chamber to dry out during this waiting period or during counting. After allowing the sperm to settle, place the chamber on the microscope stage for counting and focus on one of the grids at 200 times magnification. A phase contrast microscope will enhance your ability to visualize and count the sperm cells. 
focus on the grid, where there are 25 large squares bordered by triple lines. Each large square is divided into 16 small squares. You will be counting all of the sperm cells in five of the large squares, using the small squares to index your movements across the grid system. Develop a system for counting and do it the same way every time. For example, starting in the upper left corner, count clockwise the four large squares at the corners. And then finally, count the center large square. When counting individual sperm cells within a large square, work through the four rows and columns of smaller squares in a pattern as well, such as starting in the upper left corner and count in a serpentine pattern from left to right. Then down one row, right to left, down one row, left to right, and so on. Count all sperm cells touching the triple lines on two sides of the large squares, such as the top and left. But do not count any sperm cells touching the opposite two sides. When counting sperm cells, count heads only, ignoring tails completely. For convenience, a hand tally counter may be used. When you have finished counting one grid, five large squares, record the number from the tally counter, reset it to zero, and continue on to the next grid. Calculate the average of the two counts. The formula for determining the number of cells per milliliter is the number of cells counted times 50,000 times 200 equals sperm per milliliter. In this formula, the factor 50,000 compensates for the area of the chamber counted, and the factor 200 represents the dilution made using the Unipet system. For example, if the two counts are 61 and 58, the average is 61 plus 58 divided by 2, which equals 59.5, or rounded to 60. Then, 60 times 50,000 times 200 equals 600 million sperm cells per milliliter of ejaculate, or 0.6 billion sperm cells per milliliter. In scientific notation, 0.6 billion is converted to 0.6 times 10 to the ninth sperm per milliliter. This number should be recorded. The total number of sperm cells in the ejaculate is determined by multiplying the volume of the ejaculate in milliliters by the sperm concentration per milliliter. For example, 165 milliliters times 0.6 times 10 to the ninth sperm per milliliter equals 99 times 10 to the ninth or 99 billion sperm in the ejaculate. For improved accuracy, additional dilutions per sample and or additional chambers per sample can be prepared and evaluated. Most laboratories use a photometer to determine sperm cell concentration. Minitube's SpermaQ is a specially designed photometer for this purpose. The photometer allows for a rapid, accurate measurement of sperm cell concentration. Within the unit, a beam of light is passed through a specific sample size, and a photodetector measures the amount of light that is transmitted or absorbed by the sample. In the case of ejaculates, the photometer is typically calibrated using another counting system, such as a hemocytometer and a calibration curve is established which equates different sperm cell concentrations with equivalent transmittance or absorbance values. Hundreds of ejaculates of different concentrations are used to perform the calibration. Unlike most photometers, the SpermaQ directly provides an output reading in sperm cells per milliliter. First, turn the unit on and pull the black slide out of the lower right-hand corner until it clicks with the chamber for the cuvette fully exposed. The SpermaQ will reset itself to zero each time the slide is pulled out to this position and then in a few seconds the display will read ready. The raw ejaculate should be mixed gently but thoroughly to ensure that a representative sample is obtained. With a pipette a sample of semen is removed from the ejaculate and the cuvette loaded by placing a drop in the open end. This requires less than one half milliliter of semen. Then the cuvette is wiped on both sides with a lint-free tissue, taking special care not to touch the open end. The cuvette should be checked to ensure proper filling without any air bubbles. The cuvette is then placed carefully into the holder and the slide pushed into its closed position. The unit will display measuring in the LED display. 
The unit takes several readings, and after approximately 15 seconds, the result, measured in millions of sperm cells per milliliter, will be displayed. Evaluation. Microscopic evaluation of sperm cells for motility and normal structure, morphology, is a critically important step of semen processing. Microscopic motility and morphology estimates of semen are the most commonly used quality control procedures. However, it is important to remember that the correlation between these estimates and fertility is relatively low. This means that even with high sperm motility and a low abnormal morphology, fertility may be impaired. The initial semen evaluation should be done at either 100 times or 200 times total microscopic magnification, where a fairly large field of sperm cells can be seen, and then a second evaluation should be done at 400 times magnification to determine morphological quality. A third evaluation at 1,000 times magnification may also be done to determine the acrosome integrity of individual sperm cells. A heating system for the microscope stage should be considered a requirement for use during motility evaluations. All laboratories processing semen should have a slide warmer to pre-warm the microscope slides and cover slips and to keep them warm while preparing semen samples for evaluation. Raw, undiluted semen should not be evaluated as it is virtually impossible to make an accurate assessment of semen quality due to the high concentration. Likewise, the swirling motion observed in raw semen samples does not indicate motility of individual sperm cells and should not be used as an indicator of quality. Virtually all bore semen samples must be diluted with an extender prior to evaluation of motility. Place a drop of extended semen on a warm slide and place a cover slip gently on top of the drop. Immediately place the slide under the microscope and focus on the sperm cells under either 100 times or 200 times magnification. Observe the movement of individual sperm cells and make an overall evaluation of the ejaculate, giving it a quality score indicating the percent of motile sperm cells. Be realistic about your evaluations and the motility scores you give the samples. Now look for abnormalities of individual sperm cells, such as proximal and distal cytoplasmic droplets, deformed heads, and bent or kinked tails. Sperm cells with these abnormalities are generally considered to be incapable of fertilization, as are non-motile cells. Again, give the sample a score. Next, a composite score should be given, which takes both motility and morphology into account. Sperm cells which are considered non-motal and have a morphological abnormality should not be considered twice, as your goal is to give the sample a score which indicates the percent of normal motile sperm cells. Because of the relative low correlation between motility, morphology, and fertility, and the inability of the human eye to accurately assess motility, the industry has generally accepted that a minimum motility cutoff should be approximately 60%. Ejaculates with motility less than 60% should not be used. The number of normal motil sperm in the ejaculate is determined by multiplying the percent of normal motil sperm cells and the total number of sperm in the ejaculate. For example, if the motility score is 95% and the morphology score is 90% normal, the composite score is 0.95 times 0.9 or 85% normal motil sperm. Then, the number of normal motil sperm in the ejaculate is the total sperm in ejaculate times the composite score. For example, 96.7 times 10 to the 9th total sperm times 0.85 equals 82.2 times 10 to the 9th total normal motil sperm in the ejaculate. To determine the number of doses of semen that can be made, the number of normal motile sperm is divided by the number of sperm desired per dose. If, for example, 3.5 billion normal motile sperm will be in each AI dose, then 82.2 times 10 to the 9th divided by 3.5 times 10 to the 9th equals 23 doses, which can be made from this ejaculate. Once the number of doses of semen to be made has been determined, the next step is to add the correct quantity of semen extender to the ejaculate. This can easily be done 
by measuring the volume by weight as the extender is added to the ejaculate or with the assistance of a peristaltic pump from a large extender stock in a water bath or from a large vat of extender. Adding the extender to the ejaculate can be done in one step. You should always add extender to the semen to prevent dilution shock and do so slowly by letting it run gently down the side of the container into the semen. Once the ejaculate has been fully extended, it should be gently but thoroughly mixed. A sample should be evaluated again under the microscope. If the sample looks worse than the original evaluation, a second sample slide should be prepared and evaluated. Reject any ejaculates that do not meet the minimum criteria for percent normal modal sperm cells. In larger laboratories, Minitube's PRISM computer program can control the peristaltic pump to add the extender by simply pressing the correct function key on the keyboard. PRISM can perform all sperm processing calculations and maintains accurate production, bore, and clinical data in relational databases. Barcodes can be used to positively identify bore identification. It is imperative that the extender and semen be at the same temperature when mixed and that the extender be added slowly to the semen. Adding extender that is more than one degree Celsius different than the semen may cause temperature shock, which could reduce fertility. Digital, infrared, or mercury thermometers can be used to verify temperatures. The importance of extending and cooling semen as quickly as possible after collection cannot be overstated. Ejaculate should be extended and cooling begun as soon as possible after collection, and certainly after not more than 20 to 30 minutes. Holding semen longer than this, whether extended or not, can result in a reduction in semen quality and fertility. This effect may not be apparent as a reduction in motility. Two or more ejaculates can be pooled immediately after extending. If one or more extended ejaculates must be held for pooling while additional bores are collected, keep them in the water bath to maintain their temperature. After adding all extended ejaculates to a pool, the quality should be assessed microscopically. Extender dyes can be used to color the extender. This might be done, for example, to identify specific genetic lines or to identify the day of collection. Only dyes that are pre-tested for their non-toxic effects on sperm cells should be used. The dye can be added just after the semen is extended or after pooling. The dye can be added first to a small amount of extender. Then the extender is colored using this diluted dye sample. Be certain that the extender with the dye and the semen are the same temperature prior to mixing. The evaluation of the extended semen should be performed after the dye is added. Minitube now has available colored semen tubes. These provide a convenient method to color code doses of semen without the additional labor required to add extender dyes. Semen Packaging In smaller labs, bottles or tubes can be filled with Minitube's U.S. bag with spout. During semen collection, the gel is filtered by the built-in filter. After removal of the filter, the lower portion of the bag is used for further processing. Then, after addition of the extender, the bag is cut along the lower lines to result in a dispensing spout. In larger labs, a commercial dispensing unit is used to fill semen tubes. Place the plastic bag of extended semen into the dispensing unit and a nozzle in the dispensing head. Place the head on the dispensing unit being careful to first bring the bag through the plastic ring and fold it over the edges. Clamp the head into place and rotate the dispensing unit to mix the semen and prepare for filling the tubes. Place a rack of tubes on the guide and position the first tube directly under the nozzle. Fill each tube to the desired level and slide the rack into the sealing unit. This unit will seal six tubes in about 15 seconds. A flow-through cylinder is also available for continuous dispensing of larger pools. When more automation is required, the computerized Minitube Mini BSP can be used. This machine automatically fills, seals, and labels semen tubes at a rate of 600 to 1,000 tubes per hour. 
After packaging, AI doses in bottles or tubes should be placed directly into a 16 to 18 degrees Celsius storage incubator. The incubator should have adequate capacity and air circulation in order that the semen is cooled to 16 to 18 degrees Celsius in approximately 1.5 to 2 hours. The doses of semen should be completely cooled prior to loading insulated shipping containers. A sample of each extended ejaculate or pool should be maintained for quality assessment the day following collection and then periodically during the routine storage period. One AI dose can be used for this purpose. Or after routine cooling, the semen from one dose can be aliquoted into pre-cooled, small disposable culture tubes. One culture tube is used each day for the evaluation and then discarded. To properly evaluate these samples, they must first be warmed up to at least 30 degrees Celsius, 86 degrees Fahrenheit, for 10 to 15 minutes and be evaluated on a pre-warmed slide. Be sure to gently mix the samples prior to warming, and once a sample has been evaluated, it should be discarded. If an AI dose is used for evaluation during storage, a small subsample should be quickly removed for subsequent warming and evaluation. The sample AI dose should not be allowed to warm up and should be returned to the storage incubator immediately. Proper semen processing techniques are a critical component of successful AI. Equipment designed specifically for this purpose and adequate for small to large semen production facilities will help to ensure success. And I think this time AI in relation to the onset of standing estrus. If heat detection is done once a day, the first AI should be given on the first day of standing heat. With this limited estrus detection, when an animal is first detected in heat, she may actually have been in heat for as much as 24 hours. The second AI should then be done approximately 18 to 24 hours later. If still in estrus, the sour gilt can be inseminated a third time, 12 to 16 hours after the second AI. Suggested service regimen for twice daily heat detection. If heat detection is done twice a day, the first insemination can be delayed for up to 12 hours in sows, since twice a day detection provides us with better information about the onset of estrus. This delay provides more opportunity for viable sperm to be present at the time of ovulation. It may be advantageous to inseminate gilts as soon as standing estrus is observed due to their shorter estrus. Even with twice daily estrus detection, it is impossible to know exactly when a sow or gilt comes into standing heat. However, twice a day estrus detection versus once a day can improve overall insemination results. Remember that each animal is an individual and should be treated as such. Inseminating a sow or gilt that is no longer in standing heat is a waste of time and semen. It also increases the risk of uterine infection. The length of standing estrus may vary between farms and genetic lines. It is important for each farm to establish its own optimized heat detection and AI schedule. Insemination Technique AI should always be conducted in a calm manner. If the female has to be moved for AI, be gentle and avoid unnecessary stress. A sow or gilt should be inseminated in the presence of a mature boar, preferably with nose-to-nose -nose contact. When crates are used, it is best to move a boar in front of two to three estrus females for the stimulation and restrict his movement with gates. Minitube offers a complete range of insemination catheters the traditional reusable rubber Melrose, the disposable original Spirette, the new modified disposable Super Tip, the Foam Tip. Before starting an insemination, make a final check to ensure the sow is in standing heat. If necessary, clean the sow's vulva with a dry tissue. The inseminator's hand should be washed and cleaned. Remove the catheter from its storage container or protective bag and apply a non-spermicidal lubricant to the tip. Non-spermicidal lubricant Minilube from Minitube of America is now available in individual pouches for single applications onto AI catheters. These convenient individual pouches provide added hygiene control for the insemination process. Remember that during natural service, the boar stimulates the female by moving his penis within the cervix and with his body actions. 
This stimulation results in uterine contractions, which are extremely important for adequate sperm transport to the site of fertilization. Therefore, during the AI procedure, it is important to simulate the bore's actions by applying back pressure and by rubbing the female's underline and flanks to provide stimulation and induce the uterine response. Insemination procedure for a spiral catheter, such as the Melrose, the Spiret, or the Super Tip. Once the tip of a spiral catheter has been introduced through the vulva, it should be rotated counterclockwise until it reaches the cervix. This counterclockwise rotation is similar to the natural action of the Bohr's penis. As the tip of the catheter reaches the opening of the cervix, resistance to further inward movement of the catheter will be encountered. Continue to rotate counterclockwise into the rings of the cervix until spring back is felt, indicating that a lock has been achieved. Gently pull back on the catheter until it is possible to feel resistance, ensuring that the lock is good. Note, if a lock is not achieved, it may be necessary to remove the catheter and start again. Take the semen dose from the storage container and check that the semen is from the correct bore. Resuspend the dose of semen gently. Cut the tip off the tube or bottle and attach it to the stem of the catheter. Rotate the catheter a quarter turn counterclockwise to reinforce the lock. Lift the end of the catheter and allow the semen to flow through the catheter into the cervix. A female in solid standing heat will often draw the semen into the reproductive tract without the need for the inseminator to apply any pressure to the tube or bottle. Undue pressure on the tube or bottle by the inseminator may result in backflow. An insemination can take several minutes to complete. Patience is essential. You must not rush the process. Throughout the insemination process, continue to stimulate the sow by applying back pressure and by rubbing the flanks and underline. Back pressure may also be applied by the use of a saddle or breeding belt which can be left on the animal for approximately five minutes following the AI in order to provide added stimulation. During the insemination, it may be necessary to rotate the catheter for a quarter turn to reinforce the lock and assist semen flow. When the tube is empty, allow time for the catheter to empty too. Rotate the catheter in a clockwise direction and withdraw slowly. Allow the sow to stand quietly for a few minutes. Record the service date and semen used. Dispose of the spirette and tube or bottle in the proper waste receptacle. Keep the reusable Melrose for later cleaning and sterilization. The foam tip catheter consists of a long plastic tube with a grooved, bulbous shaped tip. Lubricate the foam tip and use the same procedure to introduce through the vagina. The foam tip catheter is designed to push into the cervix. This is achieved by gentle but firm pressure. The bulbous head passes over the cervical rings before becoming locked into place. Once the catheter is positioned in the cervix, the semen tube is attached and the insemination is conducted in the usual way. Remove the catheter by pulling gently but firmly downward. Dispose of the foam tip and tube or bottle in the proper waste receptacle. Cleaning the reusable Melrose catheter. It is essential that reusable catheters are cleaned and sterilized properly. Specialized equipment is available to perform this important job efficiently. Immediately after use, wash the catheters thoroughly in hot water. Water should be flushed through the shaft of the catheter and all traces of mucus and other debris removed from the outside of the catheter. After washing, rinse the catheter thoroughly with clean water using purified water for the final few rinses. The catheter should then be boiled for at least 10 minutes in purified water. This can best be achieved by the use of a mini-tube catheter sterilizer, which is also ideal for drying, and storage of the catheters. Separate storage containers can also be used. Pregnancy Detection Successful AI is all about achieving high levels of fertility. Pregnancy may be detected easily and accurately from 25 days after service using a Rotect Pregtector Doppler ultrasound device. These instruments are in widespread use throughout the world. The operator can easily identify the unique sound of increased blood flow in the sow's uterine arteries during pregnancy and also later during farrowing. Using the Pregtector, 
It is uniquely possible during the later stages of pregnancy to hear the piglet's heartbeats and the blood flow in the umbilical arteries. B-mode ultrasound equipment is now being used on many farms. This equipment actually allows the operator to quickly visualize on a video screen the shapes of fetuses in the uterine horns. With experience, pregnancy can be accurately determined from day 21. False negatives are eliminated when fetuses are detected visually. Elimination of false positives allows more efficient rebreeding programs. The Sonic A-Scan Plus is an A-mode ultrasound device which is now available for back fat evaluation, body condition scoring, and pregnancy detection as early as day 18. A visual linear display of the focused ultrasound signal provides for precise interpretation. Data is stored within the unit, which also easily interfaces with a PC for transfer of individual animal pregnancy and or condition data to herd management software. The essential components of In de varkenshouderij is het herkennen van bronsverschijnselen en de daarop gebaseerde bronsdetectie van groot belang. Op welke punten moeten we nu letten als we willen vaststellen of er in een koppel een bronstig dier aanwezig is? De eerste verschijnselen van een naderende bronst zijn herkenbaar aan de vulva. Bij een niet-berig varken is deze klein, gerimpeld en normaal van kleur. Het slijmvlies is droog en bleek. Bij een dier in de pro-oesterus is de vulva wat meer gezwollen, het slijmvlies vochtiger en iets roder. Bij dit berige varken daarentegen is de vulva duidelijk rood en gespannen, het slijmvlies vochtig en opvallend hyperemisch. Dat we aan de vulva niet altijd kunnen zien of een varken in bronst is, toont dit berige dier. Hier is amper sprake van een zwelling of verkleuring, terwijl het slijmvlies toch hyperemisch is. Een ander belangrijk facet van de berigheidscontrole is het gedrag van een dier in de koppel. Zo is het mogelijk dat het berige dier zich wat afzondert, terwijl de overige dieren op de voerbak afkomen. Maar ook na het voeren kan het dier nog geen rust vinden. Terwijl haar koppelgenoten zich uitgeteld en met goed gevulde magen in het stro hebben neergevleid, blijft de berige zeug actief en staat geïnteresseerd te luisteren naar de geluiden uit haar omgeving. Vooral het geluid van een beer trekt haar bijzondere aandacht. Heel vaak zien we ook dat berige zeugen frequent kleine hoeveelheden urine lozen. Ook in haar gedragingen ten opzichte van haar hokgenoten valt de bronstige zeug op. Snuffelen van de vulva en de pogingen tot bespringen kunnen als typisch mannelijke gedragingen worden opgevat. De 
andere, niet brandstige dieren zijn van deze toenaderingspogingen niet gediend. Het porren met de snuit onder de buik is eveneens een kenmerk van mannelijk gedrag bij de zeug. Andere gedragspatronen kunnen zich ontwikkelen als er een tweede berige zeug in de koppel aanwezig is. Bij het besnuffelen van de vulva reageert een berig dier vaak met een typische stand van de oren. In tegenstelling tot een niet-berig dier zal een bronstige zeug het bespringen wel toelaten. Zo kunnen we hier zien dat bij berige zeugen zowel vrouwelijke gedragingen, namelijk het zich laten bespringen en het afhouden van de staart, als ook mannelijke gedragingen kunnen voorkomen, waarbij het maken van frictiebewegingen opvallend is. Het gedragspatroon van een berig varken wordt bepaald door op haar inwerkende prikkels die van verschillende aard kunnen zijn, zoals tactiele en akoestische prikkels. In het contact tussen een beer en een zeug spelen natuurlijk ook olfactorische prikkels een belangrijke rol. In het preputiaal vocht en in het speeksel van de beer zijn namelijk bepaalde reukstoffen aanwezig. De ontwikkeling van het seksuele gedragspatroon wordt bepaald door een spel van actie en reactie tussen beer en zeug. Hier zien we dat bij een niet bronstig varken de acties van de beer niet de gewenste reacties van de zeug oproepen. Ondanks het besnuffelen van de vulva en de herhaalde pogingen tot bespringen, blijft de zeug hem afwijzen. We zien dan ook dat de beer steeds minder interesse gaat vertonen. Wanneer de zeug zich in de pro-eusterus bevindt, zal het spel van actie en reactie pas op een hoger niveau stagneren. Het besnuffelen van de vulva en het porren in de buik worden wel toegestaan. Het bespringen wordt niet afgewezen, maar resulteert nog niet in een starenflex bij de zeug. Het is duidelijk dat het enthousiasme van de beer hier veel groter is. In aanwezigheid van een goed berig varken 
is het voorspel vaak veel minder uitgesproken, omdat als gevolg van de eerste acties van de beer de zeug al direct reageert met het vertonen van de staarreflex. Ze komt dan ook amper meer van haar plaats. De zeug wordt bijna onmiddellijk besprongen, waarbij ze de staart behulpzaam terzijde gebogen houdt. De beer tracht de penis in de vagina te brengen, waarbij de typisch draaiende bewegingen van de penis zichtbaar zijn. Eenmaal ingebracht, wordt de penis met behulp van een aantal frictiebewegingen tot aan de cervix gebracht. Door de schroefvormige bouw en de draaiende bewegingen van de glans, zet deze zich vast in de plooien van de cervix. De kort hierop volgende ejaculatie vindt dus intracervicaal plaats. Omdat de gehele dekking 5 tot 7 minuten duurt, is het belang van een goede starenflex bij de zeug duidelijk. Wil een inseminator bij een zeug de starenflex opwekken, dan maakt hij veelal eerst gebruik van een olfactorische prikkel. Bijvoorbeeld van preputiaal vocht dat op de neus van de zeug wordt gespoten. Ook de tactiele prikkels, die zoals we hebben gezien een belangrijk onderdeel vormen van het gedrag van de beer tijdens het voorspel, worden door de inseminator toegepast. De zeug verzet zich tegen de pogingen van de inseminator haar van haar plaats te krijgen. De starreflex is dus eigenlijk al opgetreden. Daardoor kan de inseminator op de rug van de zeug gaan zitten, waarmee hij de tactiele prikkels uitgaande van een dekkende beer nabootst. De stand van de oren en het feit dat de zeug blijft staan als de inseminator wegloopt, wijzen erop dat de starreflex in optima forma aanwezig is. Een niet-berig varken vertoont geheel andere reacties, ondanks het feit dat de inseminator dezelfde handelwijze volgt. hier geen enkele toenaderingspoging van zijn kant en ontloopt hem voortdurend. Het zal duidelijk zijn dat alleen een gedegen kennis en een juiste interpretatie van het seksuele gedrag van het varken een optimale bronsdetectie mogelijk maken.
at the request of numerous veterinarians around the country who wish to provide embryo transfer service to their clients and also at the request of dairymen and beef cattle ranchers who would like to perform embryo transfer for themselves on their own cattle. This video describes industry proven procedures and techniques for collecting, freezing, thawing and transferring embryos. However, other successful variations on the described techniques are available. Okay, cervix, you let go, advance the head, the uterus is under your hand, bouncing up into the palm of your hand. Reach over, find the right. Feel down, or there's a right ovary. Okay, just take a quick guess on the side. Let go, pass on over to the left. As you're passing over, you'll again be bumping the uterus. Keep your location. Grab the left ovary. You got a good gas out of and Then you can tell, okay, yeah. It's a bigger ovary. And this one happens to have a nice CL on it. She did ovulate last uh, you know, a few days after she came into heat. You grasp the cervix, locate your position, let go, move ahead. You feel the right horn, you can feel the division right here. You feel the division. Let the horn separate. Walk on down the right horn. Follow around quickly, you can locate the right ovary. Grasp it, let go. Move back over. Again, keeping the, the tract up into the palm, bouncing out of the palm of your hand. Move back over left. Feel down, you locate the left ovary. So quickly, you've made a, a quick determination of ovary size. Let go. As you recall, the right ovary seemed a bit larger. Come back to it again for a closer exam. Locate the right, you can grasp it between your fingers in this fashion. It has a nice seal on the right ovary. Crowned up structure, it's small, but well defined. You can feel it in this fashion by rubbing the, the thumb across it. So this recipient does have a seal on the right ovary and would be a good animal to put an egg into later in the afternoon. Good. Sometimes if you get in here, uh, they'll suck in a lot of air, let's say. You have a big, uh, tube of air, tunnel of air, you can't do anything. You say, well, just try and advance and clear up in there where the rectum squeezes down close. Take a little finger through there to hook it, to hook the tissue, pull it back. She's not, uh, she's not full of air this one. You grab it and pull it back like that and usually get the air out nicely. So she's a good animal. Put an egg in. Okay, guys, so we've all gone through. We're second hand on these girls and made our notes on what we think. CL-wise or cyst-wise. Uh, well, let's try and compare notes now. And like this girl here, um, what's her name? 6069. What do we have? 6069, what do you guys call her? 6069. Cystic left over. Cystic left over. That's kind of what I found too. You go in here, you find a small right. You can come across, you find a big left about like this, whatever. Uh, full of fluids. You could probably easily put some pressure on it and the thing would just collapse on down. So yeah. And you look at the KMR, she was at, let's, we'll assume she was heat. Uh, the paperwork shows someone saw her in heat. She just failed to ovulate and was cystic at that point. Uh, who's this next group? Uh, Guernsey No Name. What did we find on her? CLR. CL right two. I wasn't really sure. I had a, I put R right over it with an F kind of for a follicle. She was tough for me to pick up something that, that would convince me. 609 all the time. Yeah. Up with CLR. 609 CLL, I got it. I got COF2. I got CLF1. Okay, I had a left one. I called her a left one. So we got a couple rights. Yeah. That's right. That's right. You got another right stand down here, on the left we'll stand over here now. Your military right. All right, correct. Okay, I think, yeah, that's the thing. You want to go into these girls again, get your cervix, you go down, you want to find the right, what's the left? You got to be sure we know what's right and what's left. And if, once you've determined that and feel comfortable, pick out the larger ovary and go for it. See what you feel on it. Okay, now we're going to demonstrate uh, embryo collection. Start to finish. Number one liter bag of solution hanging above. We've placed one percent serum concentration into it. It's a good idea. First, take your flush filter. So the lid is on good and tight. Let's 
place a small amount of fluid into the cup first. And open your clamps. You want to come down. That's adequate. start to first come down the tube, they're not going to drop right onto the, onto the mesh the screen. Just try and find a secure place to hang this. Next step is to get the epidural injection. Take the sleeve, fingers intact, lidocaine, 560C, Thumb down, peel down, find the indentation, in the spot. Plunge the needle straight down quickly. Get into the animal. Getting lube 
sometimes we'll get all the catheters in. Go in again, find the cervix, pull, pull the track back. And go ahead again, check the ovaries once again. Get a little better feel with the latex on. CLs, one or two follicles, small points that did not ovulate. On the right and the left is, the left over is about, uh, about that large, very small, since it didn't do a whole heck of a lot. One follicle on the left. Okay. We'll find for our catheter in place. cervix. Again, this part is just like breeding. Work your way gently through the cervix. So as I pop into the body of the uterus, I stop. I stop my forward motion. I feel ahead. And get the track straightened out. It feels it's, it has started. Here's the, the external palpable bifurcation right here. We're feeling down with our middle finger. Feel the split. And the catheter tip, it ha happens to be right here at this point. It's already started to advance down the right horn. So you just kind of pick up the horn gently, trap it against the internal cavity wall inside. Walk that ahead a little bit. So again, once again, on this track, the the internal septum, which we are not viewing, of course, is inside the tract that started way back here. So we have a division. We are down the right horn. Seems like a pretty good position. We'll stop at this point. You can palpate down, of course, and feel where the tip of the catheter is. Okay, we're in position. Place 10 cc's of air up in the, the catheter. I can start to feel the balloons. Now, give me one more. One more. One more cc. About 13 of air in the balloon. Give me one more, please. Let's stop right there. We're in good position. At this point, we're going to plug on. We'll give it about 10 cc's of air. See if we can feel our balloon. Go ahead. One more. Okay. Our balloon has come up right here. Uh, for demonstration purposes, we'll let it back again. Take a look, see if we can watch it come up. There it went flat. Go ahead. There your balloon comes right up. So you'll be palpating in here, of course. You're feeling, you know the tip of the, of the catheter is. You know it's right here, so you know right in this area, you're waiting for the balloon to come up. Comes up, that feels nice, nice and firm. When I pull back, it pulls back the tract also. It's in pretty good position, and it's more than likely going to hold and stay here. Let's go one more cc of air. Feels pretty good. We'll stop. We'll take our hemostat, clamp that off. Break loose now. Take our stylet back. Place your 
Insert that back in the catheter packet to keep it clean. Take another hemostat. Loop it through. Bring it up. Try and grab a piece of hair. I'm trying to minimize the downward back pull on the catheter. A lot of downward pulls the tubing, it might dislodge and pull back the balloon. So at that stage, we're now ready to, to plug in the catheter to the tubing. It's good and snug, that's good. And again, before you let any fluid into the animal, you're going to feel ahead, palpate down, locate the entire horn. Ideally, you want the upper one-third, the upper one-third of the horn in your grasp, in your control, before you start to fill. I feel comfortable with this. Now let the fluid Close the downflow, come up above. We'll show you how it fills. Fluid comes in, it swells. The left horn is staying flat, flaccid and soft. The right horn is filling, nice and tight like a drum. You can easily palpate this when you're in the track. You can feel this real nice. Look how large this horn gets. You want to be sure you're getting clear down on the tip here. Typically, you want to massage it just like this. You can. You've got to shake those eggs loose. Shake them loose, and you're in here actually working like this. Open your outflow. Open your outflow. Massage it out. Massage the tract empty. Come through. getting full and tight. Balance it with your fingers, tip your fingers. So we flush the right horn. Try it five or six good fills. Get the cow with 